Hi, welcome back to Father Offspring Interviews, episode 21. Uh, we are currently on a little mountain getaway, uh, hence this lovely change in background. Given that setting, it felt right to kind of follow up a bit on our conversation about nature and awe from a few episodes back. Well, this is our first attempt at, at Richard Attenborough or David Attenborough or some appropriate Brit uh, sort of nature thing. Okay, awe. Someone was asking, why do we get a sense of awe in nature? And awe traditionally has been about spirituality and religion and the ineffable and the aesthetic. And it's only relatively recently that it's become a subject for scientists to think about. Um, primarily the work of Dacher Keltner, a uh, psychologist at UC Berkeley, fantastic scientist, really good guy who's been studying awe. Okay, so first off, what do we mean by awe? In a circumstance where you were struck with the vastness of something and sort of this second attribute, it transcends your normal everyday parameters of what the world is about. And as the third feature, logically, it thus forces you to rethink how you view the world, how you accommodate the facts of this vast world around you, all of that. So what he and colleagues have tried to do is understand what does being prone towards being awe struck, having a propensity towards it, and what happens to people when you induce a sense of awe in them? What does that do to all sorts of interesting psychological behavioral traits? Okay, so first off, how do you figure out if somebody is prone towards awe? You come up with an awe index or an awe metric or something, as Keltner colleagues have done, um, which is tapping into a bunch of different factors how often are you struck with the vastness of things? And it's this question you're asking things like, how often are you struck with the vastness of things? Um, a sense of connection to it, a sense of diminution of yourself, um, a sense of time slowing down, um, a sense that you're thinking about the world as being challenged on a regular basis by this sense of vastness, and then a nice sort of salute to physiology. How often do you have a visceral response to something get you to have goose flesh and the chills and draw dropping, jaw dropping, not to spoonerize in this. So using questions like that, identifying people who are prone towards feeling awe, um, but more interestingly are then experimental manipulations to make people feel awe-filled, um, if not awful. And it's rather straightforward. <laughs> they sit you down and they say, well, think about a time when you were struck by something that just filled you with a sense of awe. And can you write about it for a few minutes versus a time that you've been filled with a tremendous sense of pride or a tremendous sense of resentment or love or some such thing. So exploring not just a strong emotion, but this particular one. So looking at an induced sense of awe or those people with a propensity towards awe. And what you see is that it makes people like more pro-social and more ethical and more generous and economic games, which sort of initially seems puzzling. So like it's this huge, vast, either purposeful universe or vast indifferent universe, but in either viewpoint, like there's no getting around the fact that like it's just atoms scattered all over the place and there's this weird phenomenon that every now and then a bunch of atoms will come together transiently that each of us will call me and it will do that only for a while. And why is it that that makes us more pro-social, more ethical, more generous? And what Keltner has identified as sort of the key mediator is when you were contemplating the vastness of it all and feeling a sense of awe, it makes you feel some humility and it makes you feel less entitled, and it makes you feel much more like you're a little speck out there. And that's a great stepping stone to if, like, I'm not such a big deal here, and I'm just a bunch of transient atoms coming together in this whole wide place there, maybe my needs are not quite as important as I would usually consider them to be. And coming straight out of less of a sense of entitlement is a bit more of a sense of uh, 
pro-sociality and worrying about other people. So that seems like kind of a nice reason to sit around forests. Okay, uh, so next, um, G from Turkey says, Alex the parrot is the only non-human animal to ask a question. Why is it not one of the great apes, but a bird? What makes the bird's brain so unique? Well, G, right off the bat, I have to disagree with you strongly. Your notion that Alex the parrot or a parrot or parrots or birds are the only things who can ask questions. And as evidence, I give you the following film clip, which was just taken yesterday. And I will pause here while you all watch Safi, our, our very willing demonstration model. All right, Safi. Okay. Well, get it. Hi. So, in the aftermath, all I can say is it's just obvious that he is asking a question, which is, can you throw the frisbee? please, back into that lake. Okay, so that might be getting carried away with it. He may just have been saying, can you throw the Frisbee? Or actually, maybe this was not interrogatory. Maybe he was just saying, throw the Frisbee. But nonetheless, this brings us back to the larger issue from G of bird intelligence. And bird intelligence questioning about it comes in at least three flavors, two of which I'm going to ignore. The first one is, what's the deal with those bird species that are amazing at mimicry? And there's all sorts of cool stuff about them, how their brains do it, how they use it to manipulate other birds, including of other species. So we're going to ignore that. The second is all those bird species that not only learn characteristic songs, with regional dialects. They land, learn songs from their parents. And, but in a subset of them, they learn a new song every year seasonally. And there's been this whole cottage industry of amazing scientists who've been studying bird song acquisition and the brain makes new neurons, which was part of the revolution of realizing that adult brains make new neurons. This started with bird research, mostly this guy named Fernando Nottebaum. So bird song and malleable bird song and learning new ones each year. The third domain is just on a pure abstract cognitive level. How is it that birds and a particular subset of birds are so smart? And by this, I mean corvids, which are like jays and ravens and magpies and crows and stuff, and citizens, which are those parrots and parakeets and and little cockatoo thingies and other stuff that are incredibly smart. Okay, so what does their smarts look like? They use tools, they construct tools, and they can solve all sorts of puzzles with sequential steps of having to make different tools to use in different circumstances, to make a tool in preparation for step six in taking apart this puzzle box so they could plan for the future. And you see this in natural populations. This is mostly the work of someone named Nikki Clayton at Cambridge. Wonderful work on Corvid intelligence showing they can hide food in preparation for tomorrow. They could remember a hundred different places where they've hidden food, but then social smarts as well. They can deceive each other. They have theory of mind. They have abstractions of like stuff that Jean Piaget, the uh, psychologist, would have called things like object permanence. You take a, I don't know, you take a dog and you have a desirable object and you cover the frisbee and it doesn't exist anymore or it's not immediately obvious that it's still underneath there. Corvids have object permanence. Corvids have a sense of self-awareness. You stick them in front of a mirror and they don't do what Safi does, which is to suddenly get all agitated and bark at his image, but instead they know that's a me. You can prove it. You put a dot on their forehead and they will afterward just sort of groom there. They're not looking at some other bird. They're saying, weird, how'd I get that there? And social smarts for deception and all sorts of cognition stuff. Birds like 
Alex. Alex was studied by this psychologist slash physicist, Irene Pepperberg, showing all sorts of formal cognitive stuff that Alex can do, telling same from different. Here are three objects. Which one is different from the other two? Even objects that have never been seen before. Which one has more things than that one? Which one has even more things than that one? The starts of numerosity, things like that. I think there's some bird species, I'm forgetting which, but there are always these little brown jobbies in New Guinea or something that could tell the difference between left and right, all this cognitive stuff. So why is it that these corvids and citizens are so smart? Proximal level of explanation because they got smart brains. They got huge brains. You look at one of these like crows, Caledonian, New Caledonian crows near New Guinea are the ones that always get studied. New Caledonian crows, their brains constitute about 2% of their body weight, which puts them solidly in the realm of primates, apes, and us. We weigh in at about 3%. So they got big brains. Okay, so of course that starts all the pejoratives about bird brains and stuff, and people used to dismiss brain neuroanatomy because it was just like different brain regions with you had to come up with different names, and nobody who actually cares about brain anatomy learns like these stupid obscure terms for bird brain regions, but it turns out they're homologs, they're equivalents of a lot of our brain regions, including memory-related areas like the hippocampus. It doesn't look the same. It doesn't have the same cell architecture and wiring and such, but it seems to do a similar job. And most interestingly, apparently a raging controversy in the field is pretty good evidence they've got something resembling a bird prefrontal cortex. Okay, so why are these birds so smart? Because they got smart brains. That doesn't help us a whole lot. So a slightly more distal version, how do they develop such smart brains? And it turns out another interesting feature of these birds is they spend a lot of time sticking with their parents, often pair-bonded species, so both parents there. They spend a lot of time until the equivalent of late adolescence sticking around them. That's the marker of a species that winds up being smart because it's got a lot of social learning to do. So it's birds like these and then primates that have these long delayed maturational stuff. Okay, so why are they so smart? Because they got big brains. Why do they have big brains? Because they got a long time to develop big smart brains, learning from mom and dad. Just redefine it. Why did it evolve that birds like these are like that? And there's all sorts of like evolutionary correlates of species that wind up being big brained and smart and all of that. They tend to be social living organisms. So that makes sense. Ooh, you got to keep track of all these other individuals. You got to keep track of their social relations and dominance relations. And a lot of these birds are highly, highly social, like us primates. You need a big brain if you're going to be social because you want to be able to manipulate and do your species equivalent of lying and knowing what they're thinking when you're both competing for food. And the, so there's social pressures to do it. There's ecological pressures. Is there seasonality of food resources? Do you have to plan ahead? Do you have to remember where you have cached, where you have hidden food? Do you have ecosystems where you frequently have to have what's called a fission fusion social system. Some of the time you're out on your own foraging, scavenging, whatever. Some of the time you're all back together in big social. You got social variety. You got ecological variety. You got seasonal variety. Those are the sort of predictors of species that wind up with lots and lots of social smarts, cognitive smarts, manipulative smarts, and in that regard, social primates and these weirdo outposts of bird intelligence tend to fall into those categories. So on a very proximal level, you're brainy because you got a big brain. On a very distal level, you evolve big brains because of certain social constraints, ecological constraints and such. They turn out to be a totally different branch taxonomically, evolutionarily, that for reasons of sociality and environment and ecosystem have converged with primates into being able to do some very fancy stuff. In other words, there's a very finite number of solutions 
for being a really smart social species. In other words, you could start from very different points and independently evolve convergent sort of solutions. So even though Safi can kind of sort of arguably be asking us to throw the Frisbee to him, there's lots of smart birds out there and it's been a big puzzle pushing us past some of our primate, primatocentrism about intelligence. Um, so really interesting to see. We are getting into mosquito hour here, so we're going to wrap it up. So that is all for episode 21. Keep submitting your questions at the forum found in the Instagram story highlight and bio or the YouTube video description. I'm Offspring Cher Sapolsky, and thanks for your continued support of science and the beard. In other words, nature is great, but screw it when the mosquitoes are all coming out. So yes, let us flee. Let's go. Okay. <laughs>